Good day. We are Condi Villamar and Rosales reporting under the topic of psychodynamic theory, psychosocial theory of Eric Erikson. The first part of our report is the biography of Erikson. Erikson was born in Frankfurt, Germany on June 15, 1902. Erikson's biological father, who was Danish, had left before Erikson was born. He was adopted by his Jewish stepfather and took the name Erik Hamburger. But because of his different look from his neighborhood, he experienced discrimination from them that caused him to have identity crisis at the early age because of the feeling of not fitting in the culture of her, his neighborhood. As a young adult in Europe, Erikson was both an artist and a teacher in the late 1920s when he met Anna Freud and began to study child psychoanalysis from her and at the Vienna Psychoanalytic Institute. As a young man, Erikson attended art school and traveled around Europe in 1927 when he was invited by the psychoanalysis psychoanalyst Anna Freud to teach art, history, and geography at a small private school in Vienna. He entered psychoanalysis with her and underway, underwent training to become a psychoanalyst himself. With the rise of Nazism in the 1930s, Erikson immigrated to the United States in 1933. He began interested in the treatment of children and published his first paper in 1930 before completing psychoanalytic training and being elected to the Vienna Psychoanalytic Institute in 1933. The same year, he immigrated to the United States where he practiced child psychoanalysis in Boston and joined the faculty of the Harvard Medical School. He became interested in studying the way the ego or consciousness operates creatively in same, well-ordered individuals. Erikson possessed a special interest in the influence of society and culture on child development. This interest led him to study groups of American Indian children. Erickson was also concerned with the effect of the rapid social changes in America. He analyzed these changes on many aspects, including the generation gap, racial, racial tensions, juvenile delinquency, changing sexual roles, and the danger of nuclear war. Erickson is credited for widening the scope of psychoanalytic theory to take greater account of social, cultural, and other environmental factors. Erikson is known as Freudian ego psycho psychologist. This means that he accepts Freud's ideas as basically correct, including the more debatable ideas such as the Oedipal complex and accept as well the ideas about the ego that was ad added by Freudian loyalists such as Heinz Hartzman and, of course, Anna Freud. In 1950, he published his book, Children and Society. He married Joan Serson and had three children named Kai T. Erickson, John Erickson, and Sue Erickson. He died on May 12, 1994 at Rosewood Manor, Harwich, Massachusetts. United States. So here we now have the theory of Eric Erikson about the psychosocial stages of development. To Erikson, there are eight successive stages encompassing the lifespan. At each stage, we must cope with a crisis in either an adaptive or a maladaptive way. Erikson divided the growth of the personality into eight psychosocial stages. The first four are similar to Freud's oral, anal, phallic, and latency stages. 
The major difference between their theories is that Erickson emphasized psychosocial correlates, whereas Freud focused on biological factors. In his theory as well, there is the role of genetics and the environment in where both genetics and environment plays a big role in the development of personality. Erickson suggested that the developmental process was governed by what he called the epigenetic principle of maturation. By this, he meant that Inherited forces are the determining characteristics of the developmental stages. The prefix epi means upon, therefore development depends on genetic factors. However, it is the social and environmental forces to which we are exposed that control the ways in which the genetically predetermined stages of development are realized. Thus, our personality development is affected by both biological and social factors. In Erickson's theory, human development involves a series of personal conflicts. The potential for these conflicts exists at birth as innate predispositions each of which will become prominent at different stages when our environment demands certain adaptations. Each confrontation with our environment is called a crisis. The crisis involves a shift in perspective requiring us to refocus or our instinctual energy in accordance with the needs of each stage of the life cycle. Each developmental stage has its particular crisis or turning point that necessitates some change in our behavior and personality. We might respond to the crisis in one of two ways, a maladaptive or negative way or an adaptive or positive way. Only when we have resolved each conflict can the personality continue its normal developmental sequence and acquire the strength to confront the next stage crisis. If the, if the conflict at any stage remains unresolved, we are less likely to be able to adapt to later problems. A successful outcome is still possible but it will be more difficult to achieve. Erickson also believed that the ego must incorporate both maladaptive as well as adaptive ways of coping. For example, in infancy, the first stage of psychosocial development, we can re respond to the crisis of helplessness and dependency by developing a sense of trust or a sense of mistrust. Trust, the more adaptive desirable way of coping is obviously the healthier psychological attitude. Yet, each of us must also develop some degree of mistrust as a form of protection. If we are totally trusting and gullible, we will be vulnerable to other people's attempt to deceive, mislead, or manipulate us. Ideally, at every stage of development, the ego will consist primarily of the positive or adaptive attitude, but will be balanced by some portion of the negative attitude. Only then can the crisis be considered satisfactorily resolved. Erickson also proposed that each of the eight psychosocial stages provides an opportunity to develop our basic strengths. These strengths or virtues emerge once the crisis has been resolved satisfactorily. He suggested that basic strengths are interdependent in that one strength cannot develop until the strength associated with the previous stage has been cons confirmed. 
Concepts of the Psychosocial Theory Psychosocial theory focuses on the nature of self-understanding, social relationship, and the mental processes that support connection between the person and his social world. The theory introduces the concept of normative psychosocial crisis, predictable tension that arises as a result of conflict between socialization and maturation throughout life. Psychosocial theories explore the psychosocial crisis of adolescence, personal identity versus identity confusion. This concept highlights the need for individual to find self-definition as well as a sense of meaning and purpose that will guide decision as well transition into adulthood. Psychosocial theories addresses pattern changes in ego development, including self-understanding, identity formation, and social relationships, and worldview across the lifespan. According to the social theories, development is a product of the ongoing interaction between individuals and their social environment. Societies with their structures, law, rules, ritual, and sanctions are organized to, view, to guide individual growth towards a particular ideal of mature adult. There are six basic concepts of the psychosocial theory. A. Stages of development. Erickson proposed eight stages of development, a period of life that is characterized by a specific underlying organization. The stages follow the epigenetic principle, the biological plan for growth, allows each function to emerge systematically until the individual has fully developed. The themes of earlier stage may re-emerge re at any point. Second, developmental task. Process by which human learn tasks required by society to which they are adapting. So society has age-graded expectation, which is the task change with age. Third, psychosocial crisis. State of tension that results from discrepancies between the person's competences at the beginning of the stage and society's expectation. The central process for resolving the psychosocial crisis. Psychosocial crisis reflects discrepancies between developmental competences at the beginning of the stage and new societal pressure. Central process suggests a way that the person takes in cultural expectation and changes self-concept. Example, imitation in toddlerhood. Fifth, the radiating network of significant relationship. Age-related demands on individuals are communicated through significant relationships. Over the lifespan, the radius of the circle expands. In adulthood, the radius condensed to a few significant relationships. F. Coping behavior refers to per people's conscious adaptive efforts to manage stressful events, emotions associated with the stress storms. Begins with appraisal. Results in prime adaptive ego qualities or core pathologies. Next is the stages of the psychosocial personality development. According to Erickson, the psychosocial stages of personality development are the trust versus mistrust, which occurs during the infancy period, autonomy versus doubt, and shame during early childhood, initiative versus guilt, which happens during preschool stage, industriousness versus inferiority in school age, identity cohesion versus role confusion during adolescence, intimacy versus isolation in young adulthood, generativity versus stagnation during middle adulthood, and lastly, Ego integrity versus despair during the maturity stage.
So first in the psychosocial stages of personality development is the trust versus mistrust. This is Erickson's oral sensory stage of psychosocial development, paralleling Freud's oral stage. It occurs during our first year of life, the time of our greatest helplessness. The infant is totally dependent on the mother or primary caregiver for survival, security, and affection. The baby's interaction with the mother determines whether an attitude of trust or, mistr or mistrust for future dealings with the environment will be incorporated into his or her personality. During this stage, the mouth is of vital importance. Erickson wrote that the infant lives through and loves with the mouth. However, the relationship between the infant and the world is not exclusively biological. It is also social. The baby's interaction with the mother determines whether an attitude of trust or mistrust for future dealings with the environment will be incorporated into his or her personality. It's up to the mother if the mother responds appropriately to the baby's physical needs and provides ample affection, love, and security. Then, infants will develop a sense of trust, an attitude that will characterize the growing child's view of themselves and others. In this way, we learn to expect consistency, continuity, and seamless from other people and situation in our environment. Erickson said that these expectations provide the beginning of our ego identity. On the other hand, if the mother is rejecting, inattentive, or inconsistent in her behavior, infants may develop an attitude of mistrust and will become suspicious, fearful, and anxious. According to Erickson, mistrust can also occur if the mother does not display an exclusive focus on the child. Next is the autonomy versus doubt and shame. It occurs during the muscular anal stage at the second and third years of life, corresponding to Freud's anal stage. Children rapidly develop a variety of physical and mental abilities and are able to do many things for themselves. They learn to communicate more effectively and to walk, climb, push, pull, and hold on to an object or let it go. Children take pride in these skills and usually want to do as much as possible for themselves. Of all these abil abilities, Erickson believed that the most important involved is holding on and letting go. He considered this to be prototypes for reacting to later conflicts in behaviors and attitudes. For example, holding on can be displayed in a loving way or in a hostile way. Letting go can become a venting of destructive rage or a relaxed passivity. The most important point about this stage is that for the first time, children are able to exercise some choice, to experience the power of, of their autonomous will. Although still dependent on their parents, they begin to see themselves as persons in their own right and want to exercise their newfound strength. The key question becomes how much will society, in the form of parents, allow children to express themselves and do all they are capable of doing? The major crisis between parent and child at this stage typically involves toilet training, seen as the first instance when society attempts to regulate an, insti an instinctual need. Then we have the initiative versus guilt. The locomotor genital stage 
which occurs between ages 3 and 5, is similar to the follic stage in Freud's system. Motor and mental abilities are continuing to develop, and children can accomplish more on their own. They express a strong desire to take the initiative in many activities. In this stage, there can be a complex that is what we call the Oedipal relationship. One can be manifested in the desire to possess the parent of the opposite sex and establish a rivalry with the parent of the same sex. How will the parents react to these self-initiated activities and fantasies? If they punish the child and otherwise inhibit this displays of initiative, the child will develop persistent guilt feelings that will affect self-directed activities throughout the person's life. In the Oedipal relationship, the child inevitably falls or fails, but if the parents guide this situation with love and understanding, then the child will acquire an awareness of what is permissible behavior and what is not. The child's initiative can be channeled toward realistic and socially sanctioned goals in preparation for the development of adult responsibility and morality. In Freudian terms, we would call this the superego. Then we have the industriousness versus inferiority. Erickson's latency stage of psychosocial development, which occurs from ages 6 to 11, corresponds to Freud's latency period. The child begins school and is exposed to new social influences. Ideally, both at home and at school, the child learns good work and study habits, which Erickson referred to as industriousness primarily as a means of getting praise and satisfaction from successfully completing a task. The child's growing powers of deductive reasoning and the ability to play by rules lead to the deliberate refinement of the skills displayed in building things. Here, Erickson's ideas reflected the sex stereotypes of the period in which he proposed his theory. In his view, Boys will build tree houses and model airplanes, whereas girls will cook and sew. Whatever the activities associated with this age, however, the children are making serious attempts to complete a task by applying concentrated attention, diligence, and persistence. In Erickson's words, the basic skills of technology are developed as the child becomes ready to handle the utensils, the tools and the weapons used by the big people. The attitudes of be and behaviors of parents and teachers largely determine how well children perceive themselves to be developing and using their skills. If children are scolded, ridiculed, or rejected, they are likely to develop feelings of inferiority and inadequacy. Praise and reinforcement foster feelings of, com of competence and encourage continued striving. Competence, the basic strength that emerged from industriousness during the latency stage, is competence. It involves the extension of skill and intelligence in pursuing and completing tasks. Then, we have the identity cohesion versus role confusion. Adolescence between ages 12 and 18 is the stage at which we must meet and resolve the crisis of our basic ego identity. This is when we form our self-image, the integration of our ideas about ourselves and about what others think of us. If this process is resolved satisfactorily, the result is a consistent and congruent picture. In here, Erickson suggested that 
that adolescence was a hiatus between childhood and adulthood, a necessary psychological moratorium to give the person time and energy to play different roles and live with different self-images. The, identi the identity crisis, uh, people who emerge from this stage with a strong sense of self-identity are equipped to face adulthood with certainty and confidence. Those who fail to achieve a cohesive identity, who experience what Erickson called an identity crisis, will exhibit a confusion of roles. They do not know who or what they are, where they belong, or where they want to go. They may withdraw from the normal life sequence, such as education, job, or marriage, as Erickson did for a time, or seek a negative identity in crime or drugs. Even a negative identity, as society defines it, is preferable to no identity at all. Although it is not as, a, as satisfactory as a, as a positive identity, Erickson noted the strong impact of peer groups on the development of ego identity in adolescence. He noted that excessive association with fanatical groups and cults are obsessive identification with icons of popular culture. It could restrict the developing ego. Fidelity, the basic strength that should develop during adolescence, in which it emerges from a cohesive ego identity. Fidelity encompasses sincerity, genuineness, and a sense of duty in our relationships with other people. Then we have the intimacy versus isolation. Erickson considered young adulthood to be a longer stage than the previous ones, extending from the end of adolescence to about the age of 35. During this period, we establish our independence from our parents and quasi-parental institutions, such as college, and begin to function more autonomously as mature, responsible adults. We undertake some form of productive work and establish intimate relationships, typically close friendships and sexual unions. In Erickson's view, intimacy was not restricted to sexual relationship but also encompassed feelings of caring and commitment. Um, these emotions could be displayed openly without resorting to self-productive or defensive mechanism and without fear of losing our sense of self-identity. We can merge our identity with someone else without submerging or losing it in the process. People who are unable to establish such intimacies in young adulthood will develop feelings of isolation. They avoid social contacts, reject other people, and may even become aggressive toward them. They prefer to be alone because they fear intimacy as a threat to their ego identity. The, the basic strength that emerges from the intimacy of the young adult years is love, which Erickson considered to be the greatest of all human virtues. He described it as a mutual devotion in a shared identity, the fusing of oneself with another person. Next is the generativity versus stagnation. Adulthood approximately ages 35 to 55 is a stage of maturity in which we need to be actively involved in teaching and guiding the next generation. This need extends beyond our immediate family. In Erickson's view, our concern becomes broader and more long-range involving future generations and the kind of society in which they will live. One need not 
be apparent in order to be able to display generativity, nor does having children automatically satisfy this urge. Erickson believed that all institutions, whether business, god government, social service, or academic, provide opportunities for us to express generativity. Thus, in whether in whatever organizations or activities we are involved, we can usually find a way to become a mentor, teacher, or guide to younger people for the betterment of society at large. When middle-aged people cannot or will not find an outlet for generativity, they may become overwhelmed by stagnation, boredom, and interpersonal impoverishment. Erickson's depiction of these emotional difficulties in middle age is similar to Jung's description of the middle, cri middle crisis. These people may regress to a stage of pseudo-intimacy, indulging themselves in childlike ways, and they may become physical or psychological invalids because of their absorption with their own needs and comforts. Care is the basic strength that emerges from generativity in adulthood. Erickson defined care as a broad concern for others and believed it was manifested in the need to teach, not only to help others but also to fulfill one's identity. Lastly, we have ego integrity versus despair during the final stage of psychosocial development maturity and old age we are com confronted with a choice between ego integrity and despair these attitudes govern the way we evaluate our whole life our major endeavors are at our nearing completion we examine and reflect on life taking its final measure if we look back with a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction, believing we, hope we have coped with life's victories and failures, then we are said to possess ego integrity. Simply stated, ego integrity involves accepting one's place and one's past. If we review our life with a sense of frustration, angry about missed opportunities and regretful of mistakes that cannot be rectified, then we will feel despair. We become disgusted with ourselves, contemptuous of others, and bitter over what might have been. Evaluation of Psychosocial Theory The theory provides a broad integrative framework within which to study the lifespan. This theory provides insights into the direction of healthy development across the lifespan, highlights social nature of human development, explanation of the mechanisms are not well developed, as said by the critic of psychosocial theory of Eric Erikson. Number of stages are and links to biological development. Concept of Humanity the applicable concept of humanity in this theory is that it is said to be optimistic. Erickson believed that although not everyone is successful in attaining hope, purpose, wisdom, and the other virtues, we all have the potential to do so. Nothing in our nature prevents it, nor must we inevitably suffer conflict, anxiety, and neurosis because because of instinctual biological forces. Erickson's theory allows for optimism because each stage of psychosocial growth, although centered around the crisis, offers the possibility of a positive outcome. We are capable of resolving each situation in a way that is adaptive and strengthening. Even if we fail at one stage, and develop a maladaptive response or a basic weakness, there remains hope for change at a, light, at a later stage. It is also partially deterministic. Erickson's theory is 
only partially deterministic. During the first four stages, the experiences to which we are exposed through parents, teachers, peer groups, and various opportunities are largely beyond our control. We have more chance to exercise free will during the last four stages. Although the attitudes and strengths we have formed during the earlier stages will affect our choices. In general, Erickson believed that personality is affected more by learning and experience than by heredity. Psychosocial experiences, not instinctual biological forces, are the greater determinant. Our ultimate overriding goal is to develop a positive ego identity that incorporates all the basic strengths. Then, in the dimensions between causality versus teleology, Erickson did not specifically address the issue of causality versus teleology. But his view of humanity suggests that people are influenced more by biological and social forces than by their view of the future. People are a product of a particular historical moment and a specific social setting. Although we can set goals and actively strive to achieve these goals, we cannot completely escape the powerful causal forces of anatomy, history, and culture. For this reason, we rate Erickson high on causality. On the third dimension, which is the conscious versus unconscious determinants, Erickson's position is mixed. Prior to adolescence, personality is largely shaped by, unco by unconscious motivation. Psychosexual and psychosocial conflicts during the first four developmental stages occur before children have firmly established their identity. We seldom are clearly aware of this crisis and the ways in which they mold our personalities. From adolescence forward, however, people ordinarily are aware of their actions and most of the reason underlying those actions. Then, uh, this theory is also said to be social over biological. Erickson's theory, of course, is more social than biological, although it does not overlook anatomy and other physiological factors in personality development, each psychosexual mode has a clear biological component. However, as people advance through the eight stages, social influences become increasingly more powerful. Also, the regions of social relations expand from the single maternal person to a global identification with all humanity. Last is that it is uniqueness over similarities. The sixth dimension for a concept of humanity is uniqueness versus similar similarities because Erickson tended to place more emphasis on individual differences than on universal characteristics. Although people in different culture advance through the eight developmental stages in the same order, Myriad differences are found in the pace of that journey. Each person resolves psychosocial crises in a unique manner, and each uses the basic strengths in a way that is peculiarly theirs. And this is the end of our report. This are Rosales and Conde Villamar. Thank you for listening.